Good morning, everybody. My name is Connie Walker, as you said, uh, from the National Optical Astronomy Observatory. I welcome anybody to say that 10 times fast and they win a prize. But um, with me here today is actually Will Roddy, and he's one of our um, wonderful, um, um, what do they call it, special uh, projects assistants at the National Observatory. I am an astronomer, but I'm at, in the EPO, or the Education and Public Outreach Department, and we are very lucky to have a half a dozen students from U of A, the U of Arizona, that is, uh, helping with us uh, uh, are three students, two of which are actually um, research experiences for undergraduate students, which is a NSF project, and, and they've come the last two summers. Lindsay uh, began this project with me, uh, in 2012, the summer of 2012, she spent three months on this project, and then last summer was Rachel Nydigger, and, and then uh, two of our students who are in our um, special projects assistance program um, at the NOAO, uh, Daniel and William, have spent a good portion of the last year helping uh, with this project as well. So thank God for students, that's what I have to say, because they are the ones that have carried this project forward and I'm very grateful for them. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about measuring and characterizing the nighttime sky brightness in and around Tucson and around the nearby mountaintops because on three of these mountaintops we have observatories. So uh, we really do want to characterize the uh, light pollution uh, uh, for these different places and I'll show you a little bit more about that. I'll get, go over uh, very briefly the setup, the uh, laboratory testing that the students mostly did, uh, data reduction process that was involved and the trends that came out of the data reduction and the sky brightness model uh, that we used was is Dan Dorisco's model thank goodness for Dan Dorisco's model so you'll see some of that here and uh, and then some future work we're considering so I think this goes forward right yeah okay so we have uh, one of these SQM data loggers, actually we have eight of them, and they are uh, they look like this configuration here. I, we have it actually in the next room over, so you can take a peek at it there too if you are not familiar with these devices. They're made by Unihedron, which is a company in, uh, in Canada that has a full width half max of 20 degrees. Um, it has, this is a detector from 300 to 1100 nanometers. It has a, uh, an IR filter that has actually come into a little bit of question over um, our um, over the past few months uh, at NOAO, and we'll talk about that. Uh, it uh, has a weatherproofing ho weatherproof housing, excuse me, and we had it set up to take data every five minutes, which um, also is a challenge I'll talk about. Um, okay, so this is pretty much our setup for our, well, not our setup, but the stuff we used within our setup for um, the testing. We had one of these integration spheres. Uh, NOAO has, does a lot of testing, so they know quite well how to do these things. And we tested it at about uh, seven different frequencies, from 365 nanometers to about 950. We wanted to see what the behavior was uh, with respect to the individual SQMs and how they related to one another. Uh, the, the typical um, outcomes were that we also tested with the glass housing uh, to see if it had any effect. We also looked at the filter itself uh, to see if it really uh, did filter out the wavelengths longer than 700 nanometers. And we wanted to, we found out that uh, because of the wonderful weather we have in Tucson, the housing itself uh, got very, very yellowed and has an effect on the testing if you don't uh, take that into consideration. So that, oh, that was our integrating sphere too, I wanted to show you briefly. A nice little device. and. Um, and so, uh, first of all, we had uh, Dick Joyce, one of the engineers at NOAO, took just the glass and, and uh, formed a transmission curve from it, and then we took the eight different devices, and with the eight different devices, uh, tested to see if, indeed, uh, with the housing, that uh, what kind of uh, uh, response we would get at each of the wavelengths, and it goes from, again, 400 nanometers out to actually 1,200 on this particular uh, curve and this just goes from zero to about 100 up there. And you get about a 10% loss at 400 nanometers and you get about a 17% loss out at 900. Uh, but there's a lot of scattering you'll notice out here. So the question is a debate. Maybe some of you out here can help us on this debate. Uh, the scatter, uh, I think, is actually uh, a good thing because it is, to me, blocking and, and creating a lot of uh, variation in the kinds of values you get at the longer wavelengths. But some of the, the students disagree with me, <laughs> so we're having this wonderful discussion uh, as to uh, the IR filter perhaps not blocking, and we'll show you why uh, there's some reasoning to that, actually, in just a second. Um, and so here it is uh, pretty much the same diagram, but shown a little differently. This is the standard deviation between the devices 
and it's uh, pretty low at the at the um, at the lower wavelengths, but it gets pretty high at the uh, upper wavelengths. So um, there's, I feel there's less signal uh, due to the filter at the longer wavelengths. That's why you see such a scatter. But uh, there's some disagreement on that, as I mentioned. Uh, one of the disagreements has to do with actually the orientation of the filter itself. Uh, this may be a, a factor in the fact of why it might not be blocking. But even if it has uh, such a skewed angle, which it should not have in some of the devices, um, it, you probably don't get that much of a, um, a difference in your value. However, um, there was a question too as to whether this acts like a light pipe around the um, around the device, and uh, some of the testing showed that it, it, it did produce a sort of a light pipe um, factor, <laughs> you could say. And so we've been talking with the president of the company, which is Anthony Tekich. He's been absolutely wonderful. He sent us a new device with a new filter in there that's bigger and, and, uh, and oriented a little differently uh, so that uh, it doesn't have as much of an effect. And Will, in the back of the room here, is doing the testing. You can talk to him perhaps during the break uh, as to how that testing is going. Okay. And this is a wonderful yellowing effect before and after <laughs> due to the weather. So this is something you have to consider. And we're, we're, we're in the process of uh, coating the devices so that you have sort of a glossy white on the outside and a matted uh, black on the inside. So um, hopefully that will help out. And this is our setup for the testing. We had all 10 of them, actually we bought 10 of them, uh, on the roof at NOAO. Um, one thing we did notice um, that I should show you, I think it's the next slide, is that if you did not orient them all in the same direction, you got different responses. If you oriented them all east-west, you got very similar responses. Okay, And then the offsets pretty much were maybe 0.05 magnitudes per square of second uh, between them in terms of their standard deviation. Okay, And the glass itself was about 0.15 magnitudes per square of second. So we had all these scattered around Tucson. We had uh, the Cardinal, I mean, I'm sorry, the Center One at NOAO, where we're, we're located, the center of town. And then about eight or nine miles northeast southwest, we put uh, four other devices sort of at the outskirts of Tucson. Uh, so we call these the Cardinal Points, and this is the center point. So you see various nomenclature like that in our, um, in our various plots. And then we have the three mountaintops, Kid Peak, where we have most of our telescopes, Mount Hopkins and our colleagues there, and then Mount Lemon up at the uh, northern part of uh, the area. Okay. And uh, here we did at each of the observatory sites for about a week or so, we made sure we had two SQMs, one with and one without housing, just again to test things out. And sure enough, there's similar responses with about 0.15 difference between with and without the housing, just to make sure things were functioning correctly. Okay, and so here are some of the uh, images. This is um, uh, on uh, Kitt Peak, and this is at Mount Hopkins, and over there is the western part of town uh, at something called Camp Hooper, which is an environmental center. Um, okay, so this is uh, all eight devices. This is obviously the center of Tucson. This is where you have the lower values of uh, magnitudes per square second. It goes all the way up to about 22 here. Uh, where you have Kitt Peak at the very top, I'm very proud to say. Uh, and then you have the other two observatories, and you have um, the three of the four locations are shown here uh, around Tucson. Uh, guess, I bet you can't guess when monsoon season is. <laughs> <laughs> and that was in most, most of July. Okay, and here is something very creative. I, I, I posed a problem to Lindsay, who was the first student. She couldn't understand why the curve actually in the er early morning went down by 0.3 magnitudes per square second. And of course, um, I, I asked her to investigate, and she came. She was very clever. She took this, one of the all-sky cameras on Kitt Peak and noticed what happened during the night. And I want you to notice two things you're able to, this little movie here, and then the progression of this curve, if you would. Okay, let's see if I can. Get this to, to actually play. Okay, so if you notice what happens, so and what comes overhead. So that Milky Way, you have to be very, very astute in the fact that that's going to contribute about 0.3 magnitudes per square second, at least uh, in, at Kitt Peak. Okay, so that was kind of a nice find. Um, and then uh, Lindsay came, uh, came last summer, and she took a look at all the year-long data at eight different sites with a point every five minutes every single night, and she said, 
oh no, I'm not doing this by hand. <laughs> so she did. She wrote a sequence of a Python scripts, and the first thing she found was a lot of faulty data, like this thing that says all fives across the row. And so she took care of this. And the poor young lady, about a month later, a new SQM reader came out from the company, which corrected for these things. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, she had a good practice in doing this. And she also uh, re removed the sun, uh, you know, like um, daytime data if there was any, uh, which we didn't usually have, and Milky Way data, moon data, and twilight data for both the moon and the sun. So this is some data before. This is seasonal data. So you have, if you can see it from where you are, you have about, um, oh boy, <laughs> I can't even see it, about 12 to, to 25, it should be less, but it's about 25 uh, magnitudes per square second. Here, the green curve is spring data, the um, red curve is summer data, the black curve is autumn data, and the blue curve is winter data. So if you can see that and how they, they look at the, the raw data and then the reduced data. And uh, for a lot of these locations, you'll see it getting a little bit darker during the night. Uh, we have uh, NOAO um, at the center of town here, and we have Kitt Peak down in the lower right-hand side. It becomes a little more level, uh, less sensitive to, you know, it's pretty dark at Kitt Peak to start with, so it's not going to get that much darker. Um, okay, so, so what we did, um, <clears throat> we looked at various trends, some of which you've already seen. We have annual, uh, we looked at annual data, seasonal data, um, monthly data, and uh, half a month, and then weekly. So I'll just show you some examples of that. Okay, so we have annual data for each of the eight different sites, and uh, you can see the trends here, as I mentioned earlier, about uh, uh, getting a little bit uh, darker during the night for the, the in-town, mostly, locations. Uh, we also see for the seasonal the same kind of variation. Again, if you want me to mention it, the green is spring, uh, blah, red is summer, uh, black is autumn, and blue is winter. And you'll see, for the, and we did, in this case, what we did is a composite. So we wanted sort of like uh, templates to go by, basically. So we took the four data points for the cardinal points and added them all together. This is the three different observatory sites added all together and seeing if there's a seasonal, you know, what kind of effects, of any, um, that we could, we could see. And one thing we really should do, and I, I, I admit this, uh, is probably just look at the very central portions of the curves without the, uh, when it, you know, actually turns on at night and turns off in the morning. <clears throat> and here's some 28-day uh, and 15-day um, uh, effects. This is the raw data before it's reduced, the data after it's reduced. And you can see that, the, that her Python scripts are very effective because if you, you probably can't read this, but I'll tell you, uh, this particular curve goes from 0 to 200, and this particular curve after the, this data has been reduced is 0 to 10. So you're looking in the, you're looking in the noise right here, basically. And so what you see here is a spike, is it, oh, I'm sorry, oh, this is a periodogram. This is taking the data, transforming it into um, the, the frequency domain, and then uh, back again until you have a period. So it's a, called a periodogram. So you take uh, wavelength, you go into, um, the, well, actually, I'll just say, you, you can see patterns from this, basically, if you uh, tra to use what they call a uh, fast Fourier transform. And you can see that, that a lot of the data is uh, showing a 28-day uh, period and 15-day period. And if you use the, if your um, data reduction is, is working correctly, it'll take out these two um, periods, basically. And so that her, it, test, it was a good test for her uh, Python scripts. And lo and behold, uh, this is probably obviously due to the moon. This is probably obviously, well, to me, obviously due to either the waxing or wax, uh, waxing or waiting gibbous moon because uh, it's up for half the night, and if you take those effects out, you're, you're left with um, no natural contribution from the moon itself. Uh, and then uh, the NOAO data, well, it's noisy no matter what. You're in the center of town, so. Um. <laughs> and this is weekly data uh, from NOAO, the four points around town and the three observatories. There's uh, not much of a trend at all in the three observatories at very dark sites. Uh, not much of a change uh, from a weekly trend. And here, the just the two uh, sets of data around town and in the center of town look very similar, but there's not much really to say. There's not much variation. Uh, and, yeah, it's just for, in terms of weekly. So we looked at Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, basically. And for some reason, it's darkest on Thursday. But, but only by 0.4 magnitudes per square second. So. Um, 
Okay, then this is interesting. So we tried to look at different things just to see if there's any sort of trend. And this is a starting point, it's not an ending point. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, we <laughs> uh, Rachel was really um, good at, at, at doing literature searches. And so I, we, we talked about looking for something and talked about Airglobe uh, at Peak. And she found this, this uh, reference from 1965, believe it or not. It's pretty cool. So this is Kit Peak in uh, Haleakala in Hawaii. And uh, to see what the changes were for um, during the different months of the year from, uh, this is over two years actually, uh, from January uh, in 1964 to December 1965 to see what, what the response was in, in Rayleigh's actually uh, to uh, of the night sky in terms of air glow. And so when she uh, overlaid our data on top of it for Kit Peak, the pattern was extremely similar even now. So it's really, really interesting. We'd like to have your advice on how to explore this more. Okay. Um, Okay, so next we we uh, were we got the permission from Dan Derisco to use his um, his wonderful nice sky brightness model, and uh, from that what we did was we took our field SQM data, our readings, and with the input of latitude, longitude, um, altitude, uh, different positions of the celestial objects in the night sky for whatever day and time that you had uh, input like that. We were able, uh, well, the program was able to calculate the natural night sky brightness. And from that, when you take the difference of the natural night sky brightness with the field SQM data, you do get uh, a, a value for the anthropogenic sky brightness. And uh, that's the difference that you see here between the two. So you're, you're looking at, you know, a magnitude or so of uh, um, a magnitude per square second uh, difference. Okay. So thank you for, again, Dan. Yeah. Um, and we also had uh, an NSBM on Mount Hopkins that we could compare our SQM data to. So in doing that, you'll notice that the curves are very, very similar, and perhaps the only difference is a calibration difference. So that is something also to be explored. Okay. So for, well, I, yeah, I'll do this. Okay, for future work, we would uh, probably, we have some temperature tests for, for uh, in the middle of taking at the moment, or Will is in the middle of taking. Uh, we're going to continue to look for trends. Uh, we'd like to do some more analysis with Dan Durisco's model in whatever ways he suggests us to, to use to do that. We'd be, we're welcoming a discussion. Uh, we'd like to explore more of the, OI, um, the, the air glow. And we'd like to also compare to VERSE data, uh, DMSP data, which is the predecessor to the VERSE data that you heard about earlier today. Uh, data from the ISS, they had this wonderful night pond data. Uh, pictures of various uh, cities across uh, the world, and our own Globe at Night data, which I'm happy to talk to you about our light pollution campaign uh, later. And, and we also, um, uh, now that we have this new SQM with a new IR filter in it, uh, we'd like to try to take some data with that as well. Thank you. Um, and then we're, we're also considering, with the help of Chris Kaiba, because he's a, he's a collaborator on a couple different things with us. He's um, um, also on the board, and he's in Germany. <coughs> at the Free University there and has done a lot of research on light pollution. Uh, he um, has done a multispectral approach and we'd like to also consider that, um, that approach as well. So I think that's pretty much good enough. Okay, so if you have any questions, I'm very happy to talk with you during break and uh, Will is very happy to talk to you during break. Will and Daniel uh, also have two posters out there on educational programs that we have. So I hope you'll, you'll visit those as well. Thank you very much.